Good morning and welcome to today's virtual event. I'm Kelly Wicker, Director of the Science and Technology Innovation Program here at the Wilson Center, and we're proud to be convening a discussion on this important topic today. As you know, telecommunications is a vital sector of our economy, our security, and our global society. It enables innovation, connectivity, and productivity across all industries and regions. Gaps in the security of our telecommunications networks can cause serious economic damage or worse, and can open our interconnected public, private, and government systems to serious attacks. And as highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic, connectivity is vital for citizens to access information, education, and participate in the modern economy. Our government has worked to invest in technologies to improve our connectivity and security, and to invest in the expansion of our networks to ensure that every American has a fast and reliable connection and every business has the infrastructure they need to stay secure and competitive. Open radio access networks have received a lot of attention and investment in addressing national security vulnerabilities surrounding vertical telecommunications technology and building future capacity with major investments made possible by the Chips and Science Act, NTIA's Wireless Innovation Fund, and the State Department's International Technology and Security Innovation Fund, among others. Today, we're gonna to hear from some of the leading experts and stakeholders to discuss lessons to learn from the global rollout of ORAN and what promises to be a constructive dialogue to scope out possible next steps for the US government on telecommunications investment. I'm pleased to now introduce our moderator, Mark Kennedy, a fellow director of mine here at the Wilson Center. Mark leads our new WABA Institute for Strategic Competition, which focuses its work on trade, energy, and most importantly for our conversation today, infrastructure and its role in geopolitical competition. Mark joined the Wilson Center after an illustrious career in higher education, including his time serving as president of the University of Colorado, president of the University of North Dakota, and having served as a United States congressman from Minnesota. We're privileged to have Mark at the Wilson Center, and we're privileged to have him join us here today. Mark, I'll hand it off to you to introduce our panelists. Kelly, thank you so much, and I'm pleased to be partnering with you on this rock star panel that we have discussing the exciting this exciting new technology that is advancing quickly beyond our shores and has profound implications for the future of telecommunications. Let me briefly introduce our guest, then I will ask our panelists a few questions. And my goal is that we maybe have some time at the end for some questions. First of all, we have Jennifer Bacchus, Senior Bureau Official and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State at the Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy at the US Department of State. We're honored to have her with us here today. We also have Ganesh Balasubramian, Global Vice President for 5G at NEC Corporation. Becky Fraser, Vice President for Government Affairs with Qualcomm. Stephen Hermanson, Global Senior Manager, Security Regulation and Relations with the group, with the group External Relations at Vodafone. David Jeppinson, uh, joining us from uh, NTT Docomo, where he's Vice President, Cleet Johnson, Senior Fellow for Strategic Technology Program at CSIS. Open RAN and open so or open source open radio access network is a collaboration of equipment makers and telecoms in various groupings to offer a complete telecommunication solution to consumers. A key to its development is establishing open RAN standards so that this network can incorporate with gears made from any vendor, so long as they meet those standards. And without having to rely on any one vendor for all the equipment, carriers and enterprise have more opportunity to integrate the best option for each level of the stack. The promise of agreed standards for Open RAN is that it would allow deployment of 5G and other cellular networks to incorporate less expensive and result in faster innovation of features and services. What is great to watch is the development of the collaboration of companies around the world. We have, for example, two of our panelists, Vodafone, the UK's largest mobile phone company, and NTT Docomo, which is Japan's largest mobile firm, teaming up to harmonize mobile operating system integration and test processes. So a great group here, we'll get right into it. Let me start out with my first question with Stephen Hermanson from Vodafone, who joins us today from London. Stephen, please share your thoughts on the exciting things going on at Open RAN and the collaborations that you guys are involved in. Thank you, Mark, and, uh, and thank you to the uh, to the Wilson Center uh, and yourself for this opportunity to speak. 
Um, Vodafone is a, a strong supporter of open brand, as I'm sure many are familiar with, and we highly value the sort of transatlantic collaboration on the technology issues. As a um, European company with a global footprint, uh, Vodafone is a digital enabler for growth, and we are ex really excited about the future of open brand. As such, we, we committed to the de development and large scale deployment of open RAN, aiming to have open RAN in 30% of our European networks by 2030, and looking for more opportunities to, to roll out open RAN at scale. Uh, for example, in the UK, we plan to have 2,500 sites in operation by 2027. So, with Global deployments now reaching those sorts of numbers into the tens of thousands of sites. Open RAN really is closing the gap with traditional mobile radio networks in terms of feature parity and performance. And a lot of that stems from the very good collaboration that's taken place at various levels of the Open RAN stack, um, from the operators um, all the way through the software to the hardware. However, the development of these networks is a journey, right? And we embrace the reality of a hybrid world that includes single stack and open RAN networks working side by side. But the key, the key point here is that open RAN is really going to drive competition, leading to new entrants, as you were saying earlier, greater innovation, flexibility in deployment. And the, the real point here is creates our ability to create greater resilience. I'd say in my opening remarks here that you know the supplier diversity and resilience that we get from this um, are really important to address the sectoral and geopolitical challenges that face both Europe and the US and require transatlantic solutions. Um, you won't have to look very hard to find um, in the public domain all of the, the various um, initiatives and announcements that Vodafone has made in collaboration with many partners, some of whom are on the panel with us today, such as Docomo, Qualcomm, um, really just trying to work at various layers of the stack to, to demonstrate that it's, it's real, it's live, it's working, it's deployable. Um, we just need to get the scale. Great opening remarks, Stephen. Very much appreciate that. Uh, David, we'll turn to you. Uh, Docomo is also very engaged. Uh, give us your thoughts on what's going on in the future of Open RAN. Sure. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, Docomo has been involved in this for a very long time. In fact, you could say beginning back in 2010 with the 4G network, where they used what was called a, you know, a common Interoper interoperable interface between multi-vendors. So they had a multi-vendor network in 4G where different vendors' equipments could talk to each other, which was not the case before then, believe it or not. And so from that experience, they uh, moved on and they were one of the early founders of what's called the ORAN Alliance, which is setting a global standard for the interface for multi-vendor equipment. Um, that was in 2018. Um, since then, when the 5G network was deployed, that was all Open RAN from the beginning with Open RAN compliance interfaces. That network now has approximately 20 million users. There's over 20,000 base stations that are all Open RAN multi vendor base, base stations. And so one of the criticisms or concerns that is sometimes raised about Open RAN is, is it, has it ever been tested at scale? And I would argue that in the case of Japan and Docomo, they have achieved this at some significant scale um, and, and have made some early uh, findings from that. As that moves on, where the industry is moving is, is into what's called virtual RAN or, or the attempt to have an open virtual RAN, not a closed virtual RAN. But the big challenges with that are both integration and the interoperability testing. Now, the integration at first took a long time to figure out. You, you know, we have a, a multi-vendor virtual RAN solution that involves almost 20 different vendors, many of which are 
significant U.S. players such as Qualcomm, NVIDIA, Dell, um, HP, and others that are in this suite that's been integrated. Some simple things such as everybody's on a different upgrade cycle. So when you have one player in a multi-vendor package that upgrades outside of the same cycle as your other vendors, the whole thing will break down. So you have to get everybody on a similar upgrade cycle. And that's, believe it or not, a very difficult thing to do with many different vendors and companies, many which are competing with, you, with each other. So Docomo has been working hard to do the integration. They have created what's now four different packages of pre-integrated solutions that can be done in a virtual RAN um, scenario. Um, that, you know, now the challenge is, the, the goal is to try to share this and create a, a global ecosystem that can be shared with, with other players around the world. Um, with that, you know, just for an example, on the testing, they've created a, a remote testing platform, and that's where there's cooperation now with Vodafone to harmonize the different testing and interoperability platforms. When Docomo first started the interoperability testing, it would take six months to bring a new vendor into your network. That went quickly went down to three months. It's now down to one week. You can, with this testing platform, you could bring a new vendor in and, and have it interoper operable with the rest of your network. Um, and there's a lot of activity going on that's really promising with, with some of the partners in this ecosystem. Qualcomm has made some significant announcements, which Becky can talk about later, but, but dealing with one of the challenges and criticisms that's come up about open random with being the, the, um, the, um, um, the power consumption issue and, and that's making some, there's been some exciting announcements that are making some big improvements on, on the power consumption issue. Um, in any, just to sum up, you know, there is a lot of, of movement on open RAM. It looks promising. There's a lot of work to be done to try to get an entire ecosystem of carriers and as, as my colleague from Vodafone mentioned, to try to get the interoperability between a, verdict, a, a, a legacy stack and an open stack to talk to each other, that's the big challenge coming forward as well. And then as we move into virtual RAN, as I mentioned, we want the virtual RAN to be an open platform uh, as well, not to have vir virtual RAN become a single vendor um, solution. So that's where I'll end my remarks there for now. Well, David, Thanks. thank you for that summary. And you talked about some challenges, but you also talked from going to multi-months to one week, you know, in your testing. So we're hopeful that that kind of progress, you know, continues and, and addressing many of the other challenges. So Ganesh, you have a, a global perch and we've just heard from UK that they're getting, a, not just UK, but Vodafone has a much broader geographic footprint, uh, very significant rollout of Open RAN there. We heard David talk about the significant Open RAN enrollment uh, and, and rollout going on in Japan. What's what's your view as to the trajectory that we're really on in this Open RAN? Thanks, Mark. Um, NEC has been a big proponent of this open ecosystem, uh, open RAN technology, way uh, from day one. Uh, you know, we've been in the telecom uh, space for many decades, and this is just another step in the right direction. And NEC has been putting their entire muscle and commitment uh, behind this open uh, ecosystem. Um, the the key, I mean, everybody's talking about innovation. Uh, I think, you know, Becky's here from Qualcomm. They're doing some great stuff uh, when it comes to, you know, helping uh, this whole ecosystem move the needle. Um, and then there are pieces within different RU vendors and there are pieces within different CUDU vendors that are, you know, innovating in different fronts. But I want to spend some time today to talk about the execution piece of it, right? So the innovation piece of it is one, but globally, how are carriers adopting uh, the actual uh, open RAN and how are they executing on deploying and uh, developing on their existing ecosystem? I think that's 
has changed significantly in the last 12 to 18 months uh, time frame. And I think in the, in the coming 12 to 18 months, it's going to exponentially improve, like David just mentioned, you know, moving from months to weeks in the IoT cycle. I think that's going to improve. Uh, what we've seen in the last 12 to 18 months is carriers that were in the inception stage where they were still incubating and trying to understand, well, is open RAN the right technology or is it not? Um, uh, have now moved to a field trial, have now moved to a semi-commercialization aspect uh, in the last 12 to 18 months, which is given the vendor community uh, to you know, learn uh, as we deploy, um, you know, make mistakes and improve uh, on the various products and deployments that we have ongoing. Um, so I think that's a huge cycle. And again, you know, going back to the comments both Stephen and uh, David mentioned, having that IoT between different pieces of that open RAN standardized to a certain extent has been happening the last 12 to 18 months and also making sure that the various vendors and partners communicate with each, each other much more effectively and align on update cycles, upgrade cycles, how the programs are run um, has been you know, vastly improved in the last 12, 18 months. And I think in, in, the, in the following subsequent uh, years, I think that efficiency and those processes and thoughts and the lessons learned will help uh, the faster adoption of open RAN uh, in, in, in the coming in the coming months. I think that globally has, has taken, has been a big, big change in, in a positive way uh, to take, you know, ideas and innovation that were uh, in the inception incubation uh, stage to, you know, moving to consumers who are actually making calls and using the internet, uh, using open brand technology. I think that has happened in this time frame, and because of that and the lessons learned, I think the future looks very bright. Um, uh, the adoption is just going to exponentially blow up, uh, and I think uh, a lot of carriers are seeing the value uh, firsthand as opposed to looking at it from Excel spreadsheets. I think that's going to be huge advantage in the coming uh, uh, months and years. Ganesh, you've talked about a lot of lessons learned, but also with all the activity you described with uh, test and moving it to commercialization, a lot of lessons being learned in that process of activity going on around the world. Uh, Becky, you're with Qualcomm. Qualcomm as a leading uh, chip software uh, services uh, company is a critical component in this stack and many of, of the uh, applications for Open RAN. Uh, maybe tie it all together for us if you could from Qualcomm's perspective. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate Wilson Center convening today's discussion. And I have to say, I spend a lot of time on Open RAN, and yet I still found the comments of the previous panelists really exciting. So compliments to those companies for the work that's underway. It's uh, really significant. So Qualcomm is at the forefront of developing the foundational technologies and products upon which Open RAN deployments will be built. We made some of our first announcements on the intent to enter the market in October of 2020 with several of our operator partners. And we've come a really long way in a short period of time given the significant engineering work needed. Qualcomm's focus is on bringing in cutting edge high performance radios into both the DU and the RU portion of the infrastructure solutions. DU is the distributed unit and RU is the radio unit. It's these two components that make up the foundational building blocks of infrastructure. Qualcomm's modem RF platforms are the building blocks and a lot of our infrastructure partners are writing the L2, L3 software and bringing in other pieces and together, this makes a complete infrastructure product. And we're working across the ecosystem to bring these solutions to commercialization. To pull it all together, as you asked, Mark, I'd offer that many of us in the telecom and the ICT sector are focused on Open RAN's performance because a cloud native architecture is needed in infrastructure as we head into the evolution of 5G and the capabilities in the network that we all desire. And so since October of 2020, we've made, we've been intent on accelerating the commercialization of Open RAN, and we've had a number of significant milestones. In September of 2022, Qualcomm announced that we'd provided our technology for sampling to global 
customers and partners for integration and verification of next generation open RAN mobile infrastructure solutions. And then in February of this year at Mobile World Congress, we announced further work with several of our partners on the post-demo lab testing integration work as the innovative engineers across all of our companies do the hard work on the test, the integration, the interoperability. It's this action in the lab transitioning to the field where we're showing Open RAN's capabilities when it comes to high performance, low power radio solutions. We hope to continue to prove this out to advance commercialization quickly along with many of our partners across the ecosystem. Back to you, Mark. Well, thank you so much, Becky, for that, that overview. Uh, Cleet, uh, you know, in your work at CSIS, you keep a close eye on the many policy developments related to Open RAN. There seems to be a lot going on outside the U.S., yet here in the U.S., we have the NTIA, which has a billion and a half of funding to advance U.S. deployments, and a half, of, half a billion at ITSI funding, which is split between chips and, and telecom. Give us a quick overview of the developments in D.C. Uh, that is helping to advance the the idea of Open RAN. Well, thank you so much. And, and thanks to Becky and the other uh, uh, great panelists here. I think to, to, to tie together a number of the business and, and technological advances that, that uh, my fellow panelists have discussed um, is just to provide a, an overview of the, of the policy environment and where we go from here. I think it's quite clear that we're at a major inflection point in deployment and advances uh, in open RAN and, and generally in open interoperable uh, networks. Um, it, it, clearly a lot is happening globally uh, and in the United States to, uh, to, commercialize, um, to commercialize these advances. And I, I think the, the, my, the main perspective is we get into the, into the Wireless Innovation Fund and uh, and the International Technology Security and Innovation Fund. Um, they were all they were both part of the CHIPS Act that you mentioned. The the, the crucial thing that, that we think from a policy perspective is that it will require a global vision for a global market. Uh, and uh, the the U.S. market is 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 a crucial part of it. Of course, all of us uh, who are focused on on U.S. advances uh, have. Have a have a distinct and 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 in some cases a citizen a citizenship oriented uh, interest in in U.S. advances, but in this case the 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 U.S. national interest is directly tied to this global uh, this global market and and the market that exists particularly among uh, U.S. allies and 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 partners. Uh, this this ultimately open ran is about competition and diversity in the market. And uh, as opposed to sort of hegemonic uh, mercantilist um, uh, predatory uh, economic practices. And so this is about uh, more competition. It's about more uh, more ways for for small and large entities to enter to enter their uh, radio access network um, uh, market. And so there's clearly a lot going on here. I'll, I'll just tick through some of the activities on the domestic front and then just sort of turn that into, uh, turn, get, use that as a foundation to get to your question specifically about the Wireless Innovation Fund and the, the ITSE Fund. Um, in, in, the, in the past two years, uh, uh, two to three years, but, but really in the past two years, a number of very important uh, U.S. policy uh, proceedings have taken place. Um, and I'll start with just a few. The, the Federal Communications Commission had a uh, uh, started a proceeding about how to advance open RAN. Uh, it's a it's a long proceeding that has quite a bit of uh, of input in it, and it touches on everything from the so-called rip and replace proceeding, um, where where the FCC is 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 helping replace uh, untrusted vendors with uh, with with more trusted suppliers in the in the uh, subsidized. Uh, um, uh, internet and, and telecom and uh, and wireless um, services. Um, th there are DO Department of Defense test beds. There's the Department of Defense Open 5G Challenge. NIST has a number of relevant activities. There have been uh, 
at least two uh, major um, advisory committee uh, public-private initiatives on, on open rent security, both headed by the FCC and also NSA and, and CISA. And the National Science Foundation also has a number of activities underway. Um, maybe the biggest uh, thing that has happened, because money matters, is uh, Congress has, has appropriated through the Chips and Science Act, as you mentioned, $1.5 billion for the Wireless Innovation Fund that will be uh, that will be um, administrated by by NTIA, part of the Department of Commerce. Um, NTIA has already gotten that process started, and uh, it, it, uh, up to $140 million of that one overall $1.5 billion um, will be will be dispersed uh, this summer by uh, by August 8th. There's the NTIA has opened up the window for applications. Applications are due um, on June 2nd. And by August 8th, uh, the first tranche of, of, uh, of uh, funding disbursements uh, will, will go out. This first tranche will focus on test and evaluation and certification. These are sort of the ecosystem level uh, foundations uh, of the commercial advances uh, that, that, that our fellow panelists have discussed. Um, but bottom line, we're in the moment of creation uh, here on the policy front, um, and it 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 will start uh, it will start, but certainly not end with the wireless innovation fund. The second piece that you mentioned is the State Department administrated uh, ITSI, so-called ITSI fund, is the International Technology Security and Innovation Fund. It was overall five hundred million dollars. Of which we expect about 200 or so, 200 million dollars or so, will be focused on open RAN. The, the other 3 million, 300 million or so, will be uh, will be focused on uh, semiconductor activities. Um, but I, I think the the key point here it, with the ITSI fund in mind, um, and I really look forward to hearing uh, uh, Jennifer's take on this in a moment. Is is the the leverage that it provides to other um, U.S. and uh, and partner funding programs? Uh, there there are a number of funding programs going on throughout the world, uh, including uh, obviously with with State Department coordination and leadership. Um, the cyber State Department's uh, uh, so-called DCCP, the Digital Connectivity and Cybersecurity Partnership. I'm sure, we'll hear a, a, quite a bit about that in just a moment. Um, but also funding through uh, the Development Finance Corporation, the Exim Bank, U.S. Trade and Development Authority, uh, and USAID. Um, it's still being determined how all this uh, how all this funding can be leveraged and how the it, how ITSE plays into it. Um, and in some cases, there are some statutory and other policy impediments that I, that we're working to try to figure out how to uh, how to overcome to maximize the impact. Um, but those are just the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Um, uh, initiatives. There's several other multilateral initiatives uh, that are pertinent to this. The, the trilateral inf trilateral infrastructure partnership. Uh, this is kind of the a, a partnership between the development finance institutions of the United States, Japan, and Australia. Uh, of course, the quad the so-called quad the quadrilateral security dialogue: United States, Japan, Australia, and India. A pretty big player in this space, uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. And then, uh, and then finally, uh, very importantly, the G7 Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, uh, PGII, uh, which is uh, ambitiously aiming for about 200 billion, with a B, dollars of, uh, of government and, uh, and private investment. Um, on, on these and related issues. So the bottom line is the Wireless Innovation Fund and the, uh, and the ITSE Fund kind of stand on top of a number of particular uh, dom US domestic policy initiatives undergirded by statute and other regulatory action. Um, and, and they uh, exist within a much broader global uh, um, market and a much broader global and allied and partner effort uh, to commercialize the advances that uh, that that my fellow panelists have have uh, have outlined. 
So I'll, I'll stop there. I know I covered a lot, and uh, but there's certainly a lot to chew on. Um, and, and I'm sure my fellow panelists will let me know what I've, what I've left out. Well, well, Cleet, you did cover a lot of stuff and uh, a lot is going on. I mean, we've heard that perhaps we're further ahead in terms of open RAN rollout in places like UK and Japan, but there's a whole bunch of pieces of the US government gearing up to advance this idea and better uh, put research and testing uh, out there. Others have views on what uh, what Cleet just outlined. Becky, did you want to have some comments or? I'll always have comments, Mark, if you give me the floor. <laughs> um, so we really applaud the efforts um, that Cleet has highlighted in terms of a, a wide scope of multiple governments, including the UK, the Jap Japan, and the US, along with others as they look at how to support the private sector's endeavor into new engineering frontier in telecom to support the acceleration of open RAN. It's a spending intense environment right now as all of our companies are investing in a lot of engineering time on the innovations that my fellow panelists have highlighted. And so programs like what the UK, Japan and the US are establishing are potentially quite significant. And currently companies are working diligently on the test, the integration work, the field deployments. And from our perspective, that's really where it's important for governments to also be focusing on how to support the work that the companies are doing to accelerate these very important engineering intensive stages, because it's that work once we continue to establish our foundation and build upon that through integration work, that's going to bring us to commercialization quicker. I briefly highlight a recent Deloitte study that highlighted the importance of supporting semiconductor manufacturers and software suppliers. They are among some of the companies with influence on open RAN adoption uh, innovations because semiconductor manufacturers are providing critical foundation for network equipment. And then the software suppliers are leading the way in orchestrating the interactions between the components or the interfaces. So providing funding and policy support, as I think many governments are exploring are really critical points to accelerate the value chain and most importantly adoption of open RAN. And from our perspective, as we get the foundation right, we'll have a cascade effect up the stack and that'll ripple through the rest of the ecosystem to help get all of us ready faster. And I'd welcome hearing from others in terms of, of their recommendations in the policy environment. Anybody else want to chime in on the policy environment? Stephen, I see you unmuting yourself. Uh, what thoughts yes. do you have? Yeah, thank you, Mark. And just to to echo what uh, what Becky was saying there, you know, I think one of the um, other perspectives on this is that a successful open RAN ecosystem is one that's going to need to involve both European and US suppliers, and even wider than that, right? I'm um, taking a European lens in it because of where where, where we're based. But um, this sort of translates into having to spend a lot more time trying to encourage. European companies to play an active role in leading this transformation to establish this global ecosystem. And governments can play a, a really important part in supporting that with substantive plans to fill gaps in volume and competition. So very much echoing what Becky was saying there, the, the um, many, many operators around the world are going to be um, sooner rather than later arriving at a point where they're going to be taking some strategic decisions about their, their future deployment of large parts of their infrastructure. And when that moment arrives, this ecosystem of vendors will need to be ready for that, that scale, that pace, and we need um, that to be available you know, worldwide, US players, European players, other players. Very good. And uh, clearly, uh, getting all of the continents coordinated on this makes a huge difference. We've seen technology roll out over our lives where there hasn't been coordination and it's created friction, but as integrated as the world is today, I think that's vital, which is why it's so exciting to have 
such a wide array of, of uh, players here on this call. Anybody else want to comment on the policy framework? Sure, I am. Um, I'll go next, Mark. Um, we've been talking to different government bodies and entities um, across the globe um, on where their individual regional uh, economic policies are uh, when it comes to open RAN. And there is not a single government uh, official or government entity that's, uh, you know, raised concerns um, uh, on this approach, right? Everybody, which is very surprising to us, is extremely educated on what the open RAN is and what the technology brings and the value it brings for the future. Um, and they understand the excruciating details. Um, they, they get the value of open RAN and they are 100% behind it. But I think one of the areas where you know we are helping, and I think a lot of other uh, partners are helping these government bodies, is on the execution piece, right? So they understand why they need open RAN, but how do we get from point A to point B? And executing open RAN is a, a, a big question mark, which is where I think uh, they need help. The, the U.S. government has done a fantastic job in trying and understanding that and bridging the gap. And also the funding, like Cleek talked about, is, is a huge uh, a catalyst uh, to help with that cycle. And a lot of other government entities and bodies are looking at these policies very closely and will look to most likely emulate uh, what we're doing here in the U.S. Um, and I think our jobs as partners is to help them enable uh, Open RAN much more faster uh, and be more efficient in the execution. What, I, what I'm excited about what I hear is, you know, when Cleet talks about this competition, and uh, it's not just competition at one level, it's competition at every layer of the stack. When you have competition, you have progressive uh, improvements uh, that can be incorporated much more quickly. So, uh, I mean, I think there's a great promise here. The, the other thing that I'm excited about is, as Cleet outlined the almost a dozen different places where it's bubbling throughout the the government trying to activate more action. Uh, I'm confident this is not gonna be the last open RAN panel that we have here at the Wilson Center. So a lot going on, but, but Jennifer, many people have alluded to the role that the US is gonna be playing abroad and, and you are here on what I'll call the one year anniversary of your Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy uh, as our as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary. So happy birthday to this department, this bureau that was just launched a year ago this month. Your bureau focuses on fostering international cyberspace security, digital freedom, and sound international inf information and communications policy development around the world. So you've got a, a, a big, big task and an important role and we're Thrilled to have you here. Please share your thoughts as to how this all manifests itself around the world and what role the State Department will be playing in that. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction and for organizing this panel today and for congratulating us on our one year anniversary. Uh, it's been a busy, exciting last year since as part of Secretary Blinken's modernization agenda, he launched the Bureau to, as you know, bring together the national security, economic and digital freedom elements of cyberspace and digital policy. Um, so specifically to get to questions related to Open RAN, to trusted vendors, uh, you know, we have a pretty uh, fulsome um, support, as you noted, for Open RAN uh, as we view it as one element of promoting secure 5G and supplier diversity in general. Uh, we do push for trusted vendors first and Open RAN as a subcomponent of that. Uh, we also, at the same time, as we're looking at this holistically, we also need to keep an eye on future developments, including 6G. Uh, LEO satellites, undersea cables, data centers, cloud, et cetera. We view this as uh, the whole digital ecosystem as being uh, really critical to our future security. Uh, we need to look at this in the way that it is, which is an interconnected digital ecosystem. So as I said, this is part of our holistic approach on supplier diversity and uh, security. So how do we do this? Well, we do it through a variety of means. 
Uh, we do it in the highest levels in bilateral meetings. We work in multilateral fora and organizations. We use groupings such as the TTC, the Quad, the G7. Um, and so we are working at this in a range of elements. And I can get to questions related to the ITSI fund and the digital connectivity and cybersecurity partnership in a moment. Um, we feel like on Open RAN, uh, that really the private sector is and should be leading on this. So operator demand and vendor innovation are critical to this. Government can't mandate it. Um, the market needs to act. Uh, I would note that this is, of course, very in line with the U.S. approach to many things. So uh, this is another one of those. Uh, we also view this as we already noted on this uh, call as a global and not a U.S. or North American development. Uh, we were really heartened to see that five major European network operators wrote a public letter of support in favor of Open RAN. Uh, and as I noted, uh, our bureau is supporting Open RAN through diplomacy, engagement with in uh, industry, and hosting events. Uh, one example, which is funded through the Digital Connectivity and Cybersecurity Partnership, DCCP, are open RAN roadshows. Uh, these can be in government, industry, academia, and civil society. Uh, we try to discuss open RAN challenges as well as opportunities, uh, look for ways that we can collaborate and identify actionable outcomes for stakeholders. Uh, I had the pleasure of joining one of two roadshows last year. We had one in WHA that was virtual. I had the opportunity to go to India, to New Delhi for the other one. Uh, for 2023, we have several planned. Uh, we'll do one in Johannesburg in May, where I will also have the pleasure of attending. Um, and we've got one in Europe in Warsaw in June, and we have one in Vietnam in the fall. We're still trying to figure out exactly where uh, in Vietnam and the timing will need to be determined. Um, to know the as a as the head of um, as the one responsible for this issue in the State Department and the State Department's biggest asset is our reach around the world with embassies. Uh, we ran a survey of all of our embassies to see how people were feeling about this issue, and what we can say is the results were there's a huge global interest in open RAN. What else did we learn? We learned that the barriers are often financial in means, uh, but also human capital. Uh, many network operators have outsourced their architecture, design, and maintenance in exchange for turnkey solutions. So we need to support human capital development. We need to support open RAN deployments, um, especially integrators. Um, as you saw today, companies are eager to gain flexibility and increase choice. So. Just to summarize, it's a question of if not, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Um, and just to say, I think we all know that countries around the world are eager to grow their telecom sectors. Um, so again, cost is a major concern around the world. Uh, and so we're hoping that the deployment of Open RAN has the promise of lowering CapEx and OpEx in certain uh, cases. Uh, to touch briefly on the um, ITSE, the CHIPS Act fund that came to the State Department, uh, we have allocated our first tranche of funding for this. It's going to be building on many of these existing programs that we did through the Digital Connectivity and Cybersecurity Partnership uh, with three pillars, which is develop, deploy, and defend, secure ICT. Uh, again, the question of how do you make sure that the operating environment, the regulatory environment in countries allows uh, both trusted suppliers and the deployment of 5G or of Open RAM. And second of all, once you get to that, how can you do uh, bigger scale deployments? Since I think it was noted today, there is still some skepticism about Open RAM. So the bigger deployments we can do, the more we can demonstrate that it's a technology of today. Uh, so we are, again, to sort of go back to the beginning. Uh, it's important to take a comprehensive look uh, and make sure that there is secure, diverse, resilient, competitive, and innovative solutions on telecom. Um, so I encourage you as stakeholders to think of ways that you can support a vibrant, diverse marketplace uh, and support global development and to start thinking about open and interoperable 6G because it's coming soon. Thanks.
Well, thank you for that great overview. Uh, a lot going on on the international front. And as you say, uh, we have other uh, communications work going on, whether it be space or su submarine cables that are, are going to make communications a big part of the future work of, I'm sure, your bureau and beyond that, the broader State Department. We have our first question here today, and this one comes to us from USAID. And the question is, what is your view on the biggest barrier to the deployment of Open RAN in developing markets? And do we have successful use cases to learn from? So I'll open that up. Whoever wants to raise their hand and suggest an, an answer for that uh, would look forward to. Clearly, uh, this is a concern. And, and Stephen, uh, you are very much involved. As you go around Africa, you see a lot of Vodafone. So uh, let's uh, hear your insights on this. Thank you, Mark. And um, yes, so um, this is a good question for us to comment on, given our footprint in Africa as well. And um, it boils down to some fundamentals. So afford affordability is the first. And so as you're looking for how you're going to transition from your existing um, single RAN stack in its natural investment cycle, um, and you're looking at your open RAN options, you're looking at the particular stack you'd like to assemble. You're looking at why you're assembling that particular stack, for what reasons, what is your market like, what are the characteristics and behaviors of your market, what do you really need from this, um, you know, the, this infrastructure, so how do you want it to perform, what features do you need to have, which is the beauty of open RAN, you can start to look at the available options for your stack and begin to build them in ways that suit your particular environment. So in, in developing markets, you'll be looking through and picking through all of these pieces and you'll be looking primarily for the options to do that. So going back to the conversation that we had earlier, you need the options at scale and at availability at the right price point to be able to do it. Because these markets um, are going to be you know, economically challenged in some situations. And so therefore they're gonna to have to think really carefully about the, the trade-offs that they, that they accept in terms of how they transition. Uh, and, and all of this in an environment where they've been buffeted um, you know, from various directions, you know, in terms of the, you know, the geopolitical context, the economic context, and so forth. So quite a few things to consider, but I think, you know, the, the way in which the industry is coming together to, to, and we discussed it on this panel today, in terms of working through the integration challenges, working through the selection challenges of which, which vendors you use for your stack, making sure that there's enough capacity in all elements of the stack to, to really make this and commercially viable is, is really going to bear fruit if we can just keep the pace up. Very good, thank you for that answer. We now have a, another question from the Albright Stonebridge Group. Why is it so important for countries to have a sound regulatory environment for Open RAM? Cleet, did you see your name on that? I was just I was looking for the unmute, unmute button. I'm happy to jump in on this. Um, I mean, I, th I think this uh, just to put it I, in speaking as a as a biased observer, as a longtime uh, policy official and now uh, uh, policy and regulatory lawyer, <laughs> I think uh, I, I I think it's uh, it's the the basic answer is that. Uh, the policy environment in which technology operates is is crucial to uh, to the success or failure of that technology, and maybe the the most basic point, and again, this gets to the to the heart of why we uh, why from a policy uh, perspective we we want uh, Open RAN to advance, and that is because we uh, we believe as a policy matter. In competition, as you mentioned, uh, competition at every at every conceivable level, competition makes products better. It makes prices lower. It advances the the technological craft. It creates innovation by by uh, you know uh, by allowing competitors to to uh, to put it bluntly to to beat out their their competition um, and. Diversity in in uh, in the in the supplier market is crucial, and in, really not just crucial, but but actually indispensable to that competition. Um, 
the 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 challenge is that uh, is that uh, in in any market uh, markets trend toward uh, consolidation they they trend toward uh, uh, predatory uh, pricing and and other anti competitive um, you know, approaches globally uh, with great powers uh, you know at the at the state level. Uh, it it tends uh, can tend toward mercantilist or uh, predatory strategic uh, approaches, and that's what we've seen in particular. Uh, I'm not sure if these these names have been men mentioned today, but uh, I, I feel I feel comfortable saying it. Uh, companies like Huawei and ZTE are are are, are seen as strategic assets uh, by the uh, PRC government, and and they're. They, the PRC puts a, a lot of diplomatic and financial support behind advancing these national champions uh, for the purpose of vendor lock-in, predatory pricing, and market capture. Um, and so the the policy environment is is to to prevent that type of vendor lock-in and to to prevent uh, anti-competitive. Behavior is is what is necessary for competition and diversity in the market, um, and so the, the 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 policy environment is crucial to that to that outcome. And that I think that's the great thing about uh, about Open RAN is that on the basic principle of competition and diversity, Open RAN itself is is in line with free market democratic principles of uh, of fair competition. Um, and and innovation as opposed to predation, I might say. So the the challenge we face uh, is that regulatory environment by itself doesn't naturally move as fast as technology. You know, we've seen a, a rapid rollout here of uh, of ideas and innovations and advancements that are moving forward that are are great, uh, but as you have put forth, Cleet, that isn't going to happen if you don't have the umbrella of regulatory environment to do that. Now, Jennifer, I mean, part of why your bureau was created is the understanding that uh, the environment, the regulatory environment and, and how it's done in many countries around the world will ultimately roll out and control the rollout of, of technology. Do you have any thoughts to share in terms of some of you've mentioned a lot of the engagements you're doing and the roadshows and better understanding of of Open RAN? Any further insights in terms of the perspective of the regulatory environment that we see in countries around the world? I think the demand for support is broad and deep. And to be honest, we can't meet it all, even with the CHIPS funding and our existing baseline funding. Um, and it's critically important for us to continue to show up. Uh, if we don't, other people are going to write the rules of the road. Uh, but we see, you know, things that ultimately lead to the importance of that will either uh, lay the groundwork for the rollout of Open RAN or not are diverse. Questions around how do you structure a spectrum auction? How do you write a request for proposals? All of these, those are regulatory environment issues, but also just basic business practice that governments need to do, and they don't necessarily have the knowledge or the ability to do it. So we're regularly um, engaging with them through a variety of experts. We bring FCC people, we bring the commercial uh, law development programs to certain countries. So there's both the, you know, you can do things in big groups, which are the open RAN roadshows, but sometimes you've got to go country to country and meet them where they're at, figure out what their issues are, what they're trying to achieve, explain the approach we've taken with real experts and help them move down the path. But it's time consuming um, and expensive, but critically important. Yes, it is critically important. And when you say it's expensive, when I look at the money we spend on a variety of things in the government, the amount that we spend on helping other governments with capacity building, how to run an auction or how to set up a procurement shop or how to set up other uh, functions within uh, the government, is is money well spent and not just State Department, but US Trade and Development Agency and Commerce Department has many of those that I think as we look for the long-term rollout, 
of not just this technology, but other technologies, it's going to be vital for us. Uh, I want to go back to the human capital aspect of this. Uh, you know, as we've laid out as a university, former university president, you would expect me to do nothing less, I guess. But as you lay out the complexity here and you take it to countries around the world, uh, does anybody have any thoughts in terms of how do we make sure that we have not just the human capital to run networks here, but that in we move it out progressively further and further into emerging markets, that we cultivate the kind of uh, technology savvy a talent that they're going to need in order to run a sophisticated telecommunications network. Anybody want to jump on that? Go ahead, Becky. Sure, it's a it's a great question. I I will say that in terms of um, the workforce, the the companies on this call and and our fellow Open RAN ecosystem players are doing phenomenal engineering work currently. The the immense amount of effort that that is going in to the designing interoperable stacks in multi network. Um, environments is a really intensive engineering um, endeavor. And as we continue to expand across the ecosystem, that is the best training ground. We are working with new companies. There are opportunities for cross collaboration. There is a need for first of its kind um, demos and, and work in a variety of countries where those engineers will, will get that training by working with all of our companies um, in addition to the, um, the efforts in academia um, as well to train up the workforce. So in the immediate term, there is a lot of work that's happening in our companies to that, that is brand new collaborations and um, bringing a larger pool to the table with a new knowledge base. And that will just continue to expand as Open RAN uh, deploys. Great, well, I'm gonna just throw out one last question because uh, what I've been reading on Open AI is that, excuse me, Open RAN is that AI is becoming uh, a part of the, the stack that the ability to integrate machine learning, uh, AI, it helps uh, synchronize the various different pieces and helps it uh, become more effective. I don't know if anybody wants to comment at all in terms of the role that AI will play. I see David uh, raising his hand. What role yeah. I play in this development? Well, the comment I just make, Mark, is that you know right now, as you demonstrated here through this panel, we're, we're in a stage of, you know, the early challenges of bringing a new architecture, a new model into the telecom networks with all the integration challenges, the standardization challenges, things like that. But once we get through a lot of those challenges and when you incorporate things like AI into the, into the fundamental parts of the network, theoretically, a lot of the network functionality will be able to run automatically on its own. And so for some of the emerging markets down the path, we could have an environment where it won't require huge human resources as we get it all standardized and, and the integration challenges all met. So I think there's a positive outlook in the future that, that moving toward this direction could, could be a, a big plus for the emerging markets where they don't aren't going to need so much human capital to to inter, to input these new network uh, platforms. Well, on that very optimistic note, uh, we've had a great hour conversation here. I very much appreciate everybody on the panel uh, offering your insights. The fact that we have such a, a broad group from around the players from around the world gives us great hope and promise. So again, for the Wilson Center for the Science, Technology, Innovation Program and the Waba Institute for Strategic Competition, we very much appreciate this conversation and look forward to more in the future. Thank you all, and thank you to our audience for joining us here today.